Yeah, well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. It's such a pleasure to have everybody here, and it's a double pleasure for me to get to introduce tonight's speaker, because he's, he's not only a friend, he's just an all-around good guy. So um, you're in for quite a treat. Bill is a retired fourth generation rancher from Harlington. The Ranch Two Dot Land and Livestock Company was founded in 1908 and is now in its sixth generation of ownership. Jones is an historian and a trustee of the Montana Historical Society. And he's also was an executive director of the Gallatin History Museum in Bozeman and the Barrow Museum in Martinsdale and has been a member of the boards of Humanities Montana, Montana History Foundation, Museums Association of Montana, Charles M. Bear Family Trust, and Montana Culture Trust and is now active in Kiwanis having served as governor in 2015 and 2016. One busy guy. <laughs> Please welcome Bill Jones. It's good, Deb. You know, Deb and I go back a long way. Uh, oh, that's okay. There's other history people in here that uh, I've dealt with over the years. And, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Like Deb, Deb said, I'm a retired rancher, um, and in the sixth generation, I was the fourth generation, and for the, so you can call it the fifth generation, the fourth generation has to get out of the way. <clears throat> and my sons were smarter than I am, and, and had more ambition, so I got out of his way and turned them loose. And uh, this worked out really well. I have a, a brother and a nephew involved in the ranch, too, and actually my the younger brother died uh, December 11th you know, on vacation in Hawaii. He had a heart attack. And that was a kick in advance. Uh, that was totally unexpected. But uh, those things happen and, and we deal with them and you know, life goes on. Um, my father was a, uh, people said he was a survivor of this, this uh, train wreck. He was, he called himself a participant. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, go through this, uh, you'll find that he was on the east side of the river. And uh, uh, I've got this picture, and I don't know if the red thing works or not. Yeah. Uh, this is towards Miles City over here. This is towards uh, Terry, this way. And this is where the accident happened. Uh, the water, uh, there's a dike coming out here, and the water was behind it. And this is about five feet high. The water went on the top of that. And water was clear across here over this higher ground over here. So you can see how wide this water was going through this narrow area. And basically what it did, it undermined the, the piers holding the bridge up. And when the railroad engine hit it, the pier started to tip. And then that, the, the tracks and the, everything else started to tip. And uh, the train made it across to the far side. And I'll, I'll go through the presentation and then we'll, we'll take a look at the pictures. I will point out here, this is Terry Montana. Now, I would use my pointer, but these pointers get absorbed in the use of the screens. You can't see them. Uh, but here's Terry Montana. Uh, this is the road up to Brockway. This is the area where the storm was. And the wreck happened. Uh, right here in this area right here. And uh, the interstate goes down over here. Um, uh, the other railroad track goes down on this side, on the other side of the river. The railroad people said the Milwaukee River was a north-south railroad, and, or excuse me, an east-west railroad. So everything to them is uh, north and south, east or west. As you can see, uh, the accident happened in an area northeast to southwest. So when they talk about it, uh, things are on the north side of the track or on the south side of the track. So keep that in mind as we go through this. My father, at one point, um, he and I and my mother belonged to the Yellowstone Fellow of the Westerners and Billings, and uh, he put together a uh, kind of a magazine type thing about the accident. 
which is which is very good. And there's a book coming out uh, about it too. I think published by the Montana Historical Society. And uh, so it, it's a, it's an interesting story. And the more I look at the information, I've got a file drawer about a foot and a half wide that's uh, just thick that's full of all kinds of information about this accident. So the wreck of the Milwaukee Road's Olympian, June 19th, 1938, and this happened at 12.30 in the morning, so uh, the storm happened on uh, the 18th. Friday evening, June 17th, 1938, Bill Jones, my grandfather, took 17-year-old uh, Warren Jones, who was my father, uh, and his 10-year-old cousin, John Baxter, from Washington, D.C., to the Milwaukee train station in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. My father uh, was born in Harlow, born in Butte, grew up in Harlow uh, until 1928, and he said, uh, we left and we still had shoes. His dad was a attorney, and he ended up being general counsel for Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company in Milwaukee. So that's why dad was in Milwaukee, graduated high school, just to graduate high school, and was coming to the ranch in the summer, and he came to the ranch every summer. So it wasn't something that was uh, unusual. <clears throat> Dad had graduated from Shorewood High School a few days before, and they were starting their annual pilgrimage to their grandparents' ranch near Harlow. They had tickets to ride the Milwaukee Olympian number 15 that was westbound to Seattle. Traveling at night until the next day, they went from the Twin Cities, Minnesota, south of North Dakota, and into Montana. By 10 p.m., they were approaching Ismay, and Mildred, uh, and Mildred, and continued on towards Terry, where the main line would bridge over the Yellowstone River. They were scheduled to arrive in Miles City at 1 a.m. after recrossing the Yellowstone at the Kinsey Bridge. And Kinsey, on this map, uh, this map is uh, uh, well down over in this, this area right here, this map. And this also shows the uh, uh, the river here coming into the Yellowstone, and this is where the wreck happened. Miles City was a major division point for the Milwaukee and the Northern Pacific, which followed the Yellowstone Valley to Downs and beyond. The Milwaukee would diverge at Miles City and enter higher country before entering the Muscle Shell Valley near the big bend of the Muscle Shell near Melso, and continuing on to Harleton and terminating in Seattle. The Olympian number 15 would not reach Mile City that stormy night in June. Only the four tail cars and an 11 car train would reach Mile City in mid afternoon of the 19th and on Northern Pacific tracks at that. The first seven cars and engine number 220 were left behind, smashed and flooded, while the easily recovered dead and 75 injured had arrived during the morning hours of June 19th, overwhelming Miles City's medical resources. Killed were 41 passengers, two carried under contract, four employees on duty for a total of 47. Six bodies were found downstream in the Yellowstone River. One at Sydney, two near Glendive, one near Terry, two near Fountain. A 14 month old baby was never found. His mother died in the accident. Injured were 56 passengers, one carried under contract, 13 employees on duty, five employees off duty that were deadheading to Miles City uh, for a total of 85 that were uh, injured. <clears throat> total crew and passengers, there was 218 aboard this train. It was the worst railroad wreck in the United States since 1887. It's still in the top 10 of all time regarding two fatalities. It may be larger than 47 as a, as a conductor. Uh, his name is McGee of Miles City who survived, lost his valise that would have contained more accurate ticketing information of the passengers in the cars they were in. And it's interesting reading some of the investigative stuff. They had quite a, a list of passengers, and they knew uh, what seats they were in, uh, what berth they were in, um, in which car, uh, their home addresses, um, 
uh, where they were going. Um, yeah, it, 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 was, it was quite a list actually for, for that time. And, and when, you, when you think about when an accident like this happens today, uh, there's a lot of federal come in and uh, do a lot of investigation. Back then that didn't happen. You'll see some of that when I, when I go through some of their reports. There was an accident review panel pinpointing cause and to see that it would never happen again. The railroad was trying to cover their butt and almost all the people testifying were railroad experts, testifying about the condition of the track and the condition of the bridge. It was evident that the infrastructure was in excellent shape, they said, and that the incident was caused by an act of God that could not be foreseen. Three longtime ranchers familiar with the area made it crystal clear what actually happened. A massive storm north of the bridge in the Custer Creek drainage started about 6 p.m. So this area up here, and this is really rough country. It's kind of like the Badlands and the Muscatel Breaks uh, or the, uh, the hills of South Dakota. Um, the storm started about 6 p.m. the evening of June 18th. The drop in measure, 12 inches of rain in a few hours of time, which resulted in a very rapid runoff through one outlet to the Yellowstone River. And this, this was the outlet under this bridge. And like I said, the water went from clear over here, clear to here, and then funneled through this area. And some of the same kind of thing is happening in, in Northern California at the present time. Under the 180-foot bridge called AA-438, which spans Custer Creek, that was uh, where all this water funneled. The wreck happened at 12.35 a.m. on a dark and stormy night on the north side of the Yellowstone in a sparsely settled area with only trails and no roads. As the cars followed the engines plunged into the now deserted bridge site, destroyed bridge site, they bucked and buckled, tearing themselves apart on remains of the bridge, piers, and each other. Massive amounts of water rush into the torn open cars, catching peoples in their bucks, in the tourist pullman or scattered around in the two coaches. Besides the engine and tender, the train beginning at the front consisted of a railway express mail car, a baggage car, two coaches, three tourist pullmans, the diner, two standard pullmans, and an observation car at the rear. Everything in front of the diner went into the flood and took all the casualties. The diner stopped with the front trucks where the rails now curved down 90 degrees. And there's a picture that will show that. They were bent downward into the water, which now filled the 100 foot gap with the flood. Dad and his cousin's original tickets were in a tourist pullman in front of the diner. Two days before the train was to leave Milwaukee, my grandfather went to the station and changed the tickets to the standard Pullman car immediately behind the diner. And later in life, my father talked to him and uh, uh, my grandfather could not explain why he did that. He said he just, he just knew he had to go change his tickets and put dad and his cousin behind the diner. And uh, it probably saved their, saved their lives. And uh, he never would say uh, which car the original tickets were in. There was two cars in front of the diner that were sleepers, and uh, Dad suspicioned they were in um, uh, the, the second one in front of the diner. And everybody in that, uh, in that particular car uh, died. Um, let's visit about the condition of the track that night and the response of the Milwaukee River officials responsible for that section of track. Heavy rains have been reported, so the track was evaluated by a two-person crew. Leaving Calypso at 7.50, and Calypso was a station uh, about this area right here, and it was uh, about eight miles from the bridge. And that section foreman, his area went from Calypso to uh, Saugus, which was about a half a mile west of this bridge. 
they inspected the 10 miles of track and uh, leaving at 7.50. They returned three hours and five minutes later and they phoned in the report. There was some flooding on the track near Calypso due to a block culvert and a slow order was issued for that section. There was no concern to the bridge. Now, they used a speeder, which is a little far as the river guy run up down and inspect with. <clears throat> and uh, they uh, went to Saugus and then when they, and they stopped and they looked at the bridge and looked under the bridge to see where the water level was. There was nothing to concern. They, they got to Saugus, they had to pull off because a local passenger train was coming through from the east to the west. So they got out of that uh, train's way and it went by, they got back on the track, went back to the bridge and uh, looked at it again and used a flashlight, the electric flashlight. And in the investigation, in the interrogation, they asked him how good these flashlights were. He said, those flashlights, you can see 500 feet with them. So they're very good flashlights. So they had good lights to look under the bridge and see what the conditions were. They got back to Calypso at about 10.50 and phoned in the report. And uh, no concerns, they had to put a slow order by Calypso because there was a culvert that was blocked and water running over the track. So they had a 20 miles per hour uh, speed uh, limit there. And uh, this passenger train actually slowed down to uh, 10 miles an hour through that section and speeded up and was going 51 miles an hour when it uh, hit the bridge. Um, they said that the inspector said the water under the bridge at that time was about three feet deep. They walked the entire length of the bridge. So these, these guys, if there was any rain, this was their job. They didn't have to call anybody or no one had to call them. This is what they did. They went and, and, and inspected their section of track. And, uh, and after a heavy rainstorm, this was not an unusual amount of water underneath this, in this bridge. Shortly before 11 p.m., all seemed to be fine at the bridge. The bridge was built in 1914, and with existing records, it was determined that there would be an eight and a half foot separation between the bottom of the steel girders and any known high water mark. This compared to the reported level of the water by the inspectors is concerning, but these 1914 figures were not necessarily known to the inspectors. The Custer Creek drainage was calculated to be about 10 miles wide and 22 miles deep, a total of 220 square miles. And these hills, uh, these steep hills, were there was no grass on them. I mean, it was that kind of rough country where they were steep. And so any rain that fell just ran off, uh, ran down into the bottom, and ran out. And uh, lots of erosion. So the uh, water that was coming through where the bridge is at was completely saturated with, with uh, soil. And uh, that kind of water runs faster than clear water because uh, clear water slows up as it gathers, or speeds up as it starts to gather uh, uh, soil and, and that kind of stuff. This area is some of the roughest in Montana, comparable to the Missouri Breaks. Okay, to recap, at 10.15 when the freight crossed the bridge uh, water was estimated to be three feet deep. At 10.35 when inspectors walked the bridge, the estimated water to be six to, seven, six to seven feet below the girders. And I got some pictures of either my father or me standing under the bridge that's there now. And uh, it's like standing here in the, in the ceiling up there would be the top of the, be the bottom of the bridge. So there was a lot of room under this, this thing. At 12.35 a.m. when the Olympian sailed into the abyss at 51 miles per hour, as estimated the water was about 20 feet deep. The Olympian was running about 30 minutes late and had to reduce speed to go through the water on the tracks of Calypso. It increased speed to 51 miles per hour and there was no indication of breaking or reduction of speed at the bridge. Now, uh, when I took my father there in 2006, that was the first time he'd been back to that spot uh, since the accident in 1938. 
uh, he'd been over, he'd been pilot and flew over it many times and would buy it on the interstate, but had never been to that spot. So after we crossed the bridge at Terry, which I have a picture of, um, we speeded up to 51 miles an hour coming to this bridge, and Dad says, holy crap, you're really moving fast. <laughs> and when you stop and think about it, you know, that the bridge is only eight feet wide, and you're in this big, huge engine, and, and 51 miles an hour, it's, it's, a, it's a scary. We just experienced speed in, in Europe uh, in May and June, we rode a train from Paris to Zurich, and we were standing in a, a coffee shop on the upper level of the train, and the sign there had a speedometer. We were traveling 200 miles an hour. <laughs> and it just like standing on the sidewalk, getting a coffee at a uh, local coffee shop. It wasn't moving around or anything. So, so they talk about passenger trains in Montana again. We got some work to do. <laughs> OK. Um, the bridge may have looked normal in the headlights, but the undermined piers waited as traps to the approaching Olympia. Or the engineer may have sensed something was wrong by a dip or a realignment of the tracks, but had no time to react. As the weight of the engines reached the first pier, the tracks started to dip to the west and down and derailed the trains. My father talked about his remembrances of the accident. He and his cousin were in a sound sleep in their bunks. There was no sense of a hard crashing impact that threw them about. His first sense of change was realizing it was silent, and there was no sound of wheels clicking over the rail joints, and the strong fragrance of prairie sage as when wet or crushed overtook the car. Cousin John slept through the mishap, as did others. One lady did not wake up until after 6 a.m. in the morning, so she slept for another six hours. Not that they were deep sleepers, it was just that there was no excitement in the cars behind the dyno. So these are the cars that were on the east side of the uh, bridge. Dad got dressed and went forward, entering the diner. The lights were on and tables were all set with white linen tablecloths. Two men were at the far end. One was entering a diamond-shaped opening, which was the entrance into a tourist sleeper that was balanced precariously onto a pier and still hooked to the diner. Passengers and their belongings were brought out of this car into the diner. And out of this report, I'll read some of the testimony about what happened at this point. Soon afterward, the car fell into the flood and floated downstream about 50 feet. Dad was handed a small valise and was told to put it on a tabletop. It belonged to Conductor McGee and contained money and ticket information on the passengers. And I had mentioned that, that they didn't have a real accurate count of the passengers because this police was missing. In the aftermath, it was never seen again. So the definite number of passengers was never known. The accident was reported almost immediately by a Northern Pacific section hand who lived across the river and watched the westbound Olympians, so he was over here. Here's a Northern Pacific train over here uh, on the other line, and uh, he was in a section house over here, and he watched the Olympian every night come up the track, and he saw the headlights of the engine disappear along with some of the car lights, and he immediately called Mile City and said, I think something's happened to the Olympian. The lights, the lights disappeared, and I should still be able to see them. So he called Miles City, <coughs> and uh, two crew members, after getting on the land on the west side, walked to Saugus, which was about a half mile down the track, and used a phone to call in the wreck. This was maybe 30 minutes after the section hand called. So Miles City knew uh, within minutes, actually, uh, that there had been an accident. OK, in Miles City, they had to get a steam engine hot and hook on some cars. And it wasn't until 4 a.m., three and a half hours after the accident, that the rescue train appeared above the wreckage. They loaded dead and injured and left for Mile City. Then another train from Mile City left with men and equipment to help. The four cars still on the east side, and one of those being the one my father and his cousin were in, were pulled into Terry and, uh, and then pulled to Mile City on the Northern Pacific track in the afternoon. 
have been checked out and continued their way onto their destinations. And that train was called the Made Up 15. So the train that wrecked was the number 15. So this was a Made Up train uh, that continued on and took uh, some of the people on the way and, and continued on to Seattle. Okay, there's some uh, interesting testimony that um, I'll talk about. So they held an inquest on the 21st day of June uh, in um, Curry County, in Terry. And so they had, they had two inquests. And in each inquest, they came up with a verdict. And the verdict was, it wasn't the railroad's fault. It was an act of God. Well, this one guy, um, uh, his name was uh, Griffin, I think it was, um, was asked about where this accident happened. It was, he said it was uh, at a point known among the railroad employees as a dry run at Custer Creek, um, a half a mile east of the Saga Station. And the, a dry run was was a, a creek that didn't run most of the time, only when there was a rainstorm or some snow runoff. And there was lots of dry runs uh, along the railroad, as you can imagine. Um, and this guy was getting ready to go to work. And he was, this, this was actually a guy who was on the train. And he was going to ride the engine uh, on train 15 from Miles City to Harleton the next morning. And uh, um, he, was, he was in his car getting dressed and he was lacing up his boots uh, when all this happened. And he was uh, in one of the cars, it was in front of the diner. He was in the first car in front of the diner. And this is some of his testimony. I was lacing my oxford at the time the accident occurred, and naturally when we went into the crash, our lights went out. I always carried a flashlight with me, and of course it wasn't much of a job for me to get my flashlight out of my grip, and of course I could hear the roar of the water coming down the river. And before I made any attempt to remove the persons from the car, I felt the first thing I should do was to try to get my location if I possibly could. Where we were, and to be very honest with you gentlemen, I thought we were in the Yellowstone River. And just before um, the accident site, uh, right here, the railroad runs about, or excuse me, the river runs for almost a half a mile right next to the tracks. So he assumed that's where they were. He assumed they had ended up um, in the track, in, in the Yellowstone River. Um, that is where I thought the accident was along the river this side of Saugus. I went to the rear end of the tourist sleeper next to the diner and I could not get the vestibule door open on the tourist sleeper. And the vestibule door was the doors on the side of the train, not between the car, but on the side. He couldn't get those open to see out to see exactly where they were. Our railroad is known to uh, operate east and west, so everything was north and south. Um, uh, on, on, they were referred to on the train. He got down with his flashlight along the diner to the tourist car, and the tourist car was sitting so that the rear trucks was just on the steel girder of the bridge. The front, front trucks of the dining car was just up to the concrete above. And he continued, when I got to the rear end of the tourist car, sleeper, on the north side of the car, there was water going down through the creek. I held my flashlight along the car and I could see that car A, tourist car A, and <clears throat> also the trucks on the, the trucks on the tourist car B were on the steel girders under the track. And of course, as soon as I see the location of the cars, I realized that there was just one thing to do, and that was to bring these people out of those cars as fast as we possibly could. Um, the cars didn't go in the river for, I should judge, about 20 minutes. 
So they hurriedly got the people out of the first car and, uh, and got their bags out and everything and they got them into the diner and they went from the diner uh, back to the back of the train. And then they uh, got up to the next car uh, and it was tipped uh, this way. So there was a kind of a small diamond shaped area they could see into the car. And uh, there was going to be some problems trying to get these people out. Uh, they were waiting in water practically to our knees, and one of the porters said to me, there's a leg of a man. And um, uh, they asked this guy if he, if he was all right. He said yes, and they recognized the voice. He was a Milwaukee Railroad employee uh, that was headquarters out of uh, Seattle, Washington. And um, uh, they, they, they couldn't get him out, so they took some sheets and they tied them together, and they put him under his arms, and uh, they got a hold of, hold of him that way, he got him up to this opening, and he had to let go of what he was holding on to. The water got a hold of him, and he kind of swept him off to the side, and they were able to get him up through this hole. And just as they got him up through this hole, the car detached from the one that detached to the one into the river, and it disappeared. And so they started back uh, through this next car, and the guy wanted to sit down and rest. And he said, I just can't go any farther with it. He said, we've got to keep moving. And they got him to the, to the back of that car and into the dining car. And just as they got into the dining car with this guy, that car let go, unhooked, and it fell off to the uh, south side, to the left, and floated down, this, down in the water about 50 to 75 feet and sat there upright. And uh, so everybody else was in that second car, perished, uh, because that car ended up uh, falling off to the left, got uh, wedged up against one of the piers, and it got completely covered with water and partially filled with mud and uh, gravel. And uh, they had quite a time uh, and you will see with some pictures getting bodies out of that particular car. Um, okay, and they talked about this car that disappeared off to the right. They couldn't even see a ripple in the water that would signify this car was there. So, you know how tall a railroad car is? Well, it was completely submerged in this water, water going over the top of it. And they didn't know that's where it was at. Um, and one of these guys talked about uh, the water after uh, this was one of the rescue people that got there um, said he uh, put a stick in the water uh, in the ground by the water off the side of the tracks and within 20 minutes the water came up another two feet and then it started going down so after this happened um, there was still a lot of water, and water was raising, and uh, it was causing all kinds of problems. Um, like I said, about 20 minutes is how long those cars stayed perched on uh, these piers before they went into the water. So they were they were working as hard as they could to get these people out, but they were only able to save one out of that second car. <clears throat> um, They, they talk about uh, um, getting people injured out of these cars and um, uh, ac across the river, this body of water, there was uh, a couple of passenger cars and they were able to get people out of there and there was a, a family by the name of Hogan who just lived um, uh, about a mile from where this happened and a guy was out in the yard uh, doing something and uh, he heard the accident. And so he jumped in his pickup and drove down there. And his pickup, he had this homemade ladder, roughly 10 feet long. And he got there to use that ladder to help get people out of some of these cars and made a bridge over to another car and then used the ladder again to get those people on the ground. And, uh, and then when help started to show up, uh, they started uh, uh, getting some of the um, those that had been killed 
uh, out of cars and uh, whatnot, and then took them over by the uh, rescue train and the injured over by the train, and then they loaded them up and took them into uh, uh, into Miles City. Uh, and the dike that we talked about was about a thousand feet long. It went this way, and uh, it was about five feet high, and the water uh, was over the top of that. So you can see how uh, much water there was in that area. It uh, was actually pretty stunning. And Dad, and Dad said, you, you couldn't holler across the water to the people on the other side because it was so noisy, no one could hear you. And so they had no communication with the other side. They could just see what was going on. There's some interesting stuff in here. Um, I think uh, I think what I'll do now is go to uh, some of the pictures, and then I've got some updated stuff here. Um, look at it now. We're going to run this. Oops. Okay, this is a this is a satellite picture of the area that's so rough and where the storm happened. So you can see there's no fields, there's no pivots, there's no houses, there's no roads, no nothing. It's pretty tough country. This is the bridge over the Yellowstone at Terry. And you can see it's uh, four spans. It's a, uh, it's a pretty good sized bridge. And off to the right, you can see the start of this uh, rough country going to the north. And this is from on the bridge, just looking down the Yellowstone River. This looking down through the bridge. And well, I don't know, I have uh, real uh, admiration for engineers uh, driving these trains going at high speeds, going through something like this. Um, uh, that's about half scary. And this is what the track area looks like now. And uh, it's a county road and all trucks and you name it up this way and you get up past Saugus and then you start winding your way up to Kinsey and, and hit the highway up by the airport at Miles City. This is the, the current bridge that's there now. And uh, the uh, bridge that was there had steel girders underneath it and you'll see some pictures of them uh, underneath one of the cars. But this is about 180 feet long, this bridge. And this is looking west. And that was Custer Creek? That was Custer Creek, yes. Uh, and, and my father um, was a photographer. And he was in a photo club in high school and uh, took lots of pictures. And so he had a, uh, his camera had a, uh, a good film in it. This picture he took uh, a little after four in the morning. And this is the rescue train just showing up. And this is the tender car attached to the engine, which is back over here. This is one of the cars across like this, and this is another car down here. And he also uh, was in World War II in Italy and in, in Japan. And his dad would send him film, and dad would take pictures, send the film back. And I've got hundreds of pictures that he has descriptions of and where they were taken and what they were doing. And uh, it's, it's quite a collection. And he had color film too at one point that he took uh, in Japan. Okay, this is my father uh, standing uh, at the east end of the bridge and it was rebuilt in 1942. And this is the new, uh, the new version. And this is looking west. Saugus, uh, where the guys walked to, is probably underneath this hill. So about a half a mile away is where uh, um, Saugus was when the two guys went to the call. This is uh, Custer Creek. And this picture was taken in June. Uh, there may have been a rainstorm or something. That's why you see a puddle there and a puddle over there and dry in between. Um, there's a rough country right behind there. Um, and the uh, piers that are in the ground 
Uh, they were used uh, to build, they had a temporary bridge built around this area uh, so they could build a new bridge. Mm -hmm. So that's what those are from. Uh, this is down underneath the bridge. You see this den in the suburban? They had a kamikaze duck. I'm going to carry it, see this duck coming. It just keeps coming. It kind of coming like this, and it's, damn. And that's where it hit me. <laughs> they have to go clean my windshield off. <laughs> okay, this is another picture, uh, and the, and the rest of the train is gone. How much way is it looking? This is looking west. So across the uh, across the water, there's another picture my father took. The pictures that were taken on the east side facing west were uh, taken by my father. Uh, this is another picture. Uh, water earlier was up here. This is one of the piers that was undermined, and so it started to tip. This one is turned. Uh, this should be more of an angle this way. And uh, you can see how the, this car started to come apart, break apart. This is the car that ended up uh, down below. This was the uh, second car in front of the diner. And it broke loose and it floated down 50 to 75 feet and sat there. And water was, at one point, was above the windows, was up about here. And that's when all the water was clear over to this hillside over here. Um, so there was a lot of water going uh, through this area. And this is the dining car right here. And this is the track coming down like this into the water. So is that the one that was right next to the dining car? Um, no, this is the one that was ahead of the, uh, the second one ahead of the dining car. Everybody in that car died. No, this one they got everybody out. That just shows the back end of the car. And some of these cars, like Dad said for a while, the lights were still on in this car. Uh, these cars evidently had generators in them uh, that powered, uh, powered the cars. And so the generator, and where the generator was at, it may have been up in the roof where the generator was. It wasn't, uh, I, I just don't know, but he said for a while the lights were on in this car that was underwater. So the dining car was hung up right on that pier. It was right on the very edge. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the dining car's front trucks uh, were right where the track went down into the water. Your dad was in the next car. He was in the car behind it. Yeah. And that's why he said he was a participant. Uh, he was an observer rather than a survivor. Yeah. Okay, and this is looking in the same direction uh, as where the cars. Uh, this is a car, a picture Dad took from uh, back just a little bit with some people that were in the cars behind, or some of the ones they, could, they brought out of the, that first car, uh, looking over there. Like I say, you could, they couldn't converse with anybody over there because you couldn't hear anything. And notice the uh, straw hat. And, and uh, now this picture. Uh, this was a conductor, but he was deadheaded uh, to Mile City. And I made this presentation a couple years ago in, in uh, Bozeman at the Galvin Hentry Museum. And the lady in the room said, that's my grandfather. <laughs> and she said, uh, we knew that picture existed, but we'd never seen it. And uh, so I got her a copy of, uh, a copy of this picture. Here's another picture from the front of the back. And the water never got up uh, this high, but it did get up in this area down here. And you can see where the sand and stuff is uh, over in this area. When, when you talk about that fellow being deadheaded, what does what deadheaded mean? Well, they, they got on and, uh, at some point before and it's like an airline pilot now that lives in Bozeman and flies out of Chicago. He deadheads to Chicago to go to work. So they're just riding the train to get to Miles City and then they're leaving in the morning on the train uh, going wherever, going back or something, I don't know, but they, they would, uh, passengers would ride and were deadheading from one point to another to, from their job.
Are these all pictures your dad took? These are. Anything from the east side looking west were pictures my father took. Okay, this is the engine. This is the uh, baggage car up here. And this engine is laying on its left side. And see this thing right here? That's a railroad train that went into the smoke box. <coughs> and uh, they didn't know how far it went. Uh, but anyway, interesting enough, this engine was recovered and hauled to Milwaukee. It was rebuilt. <laughs> and went back on the tracks of engine number 220 and uh, ran for several more years. It, 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 one day they could rebuild a Miles City or any of the roundhouses they had to, had to take it back to the lot. And I don't know how they did that. They must have kind of dismantled it, took the trucks off, you know, all that stuff, and loaded it on a train. Uh, now, this is an easier picture my father didn't take. This is probably uh, the next day. So, the, the, well, yeah, probably, this is probably Monday. The wreck happened Saturday night. And this is probably Monday. Water's going down. Here's the car right here that everybody inside died. Yeah. And you can see how these cars are stacked up. And this is the car that went down on the other side. You can see how this pier is tipped. And this, this one is kind of destroyed. And there's people here, and they're driving out from uh, Miles City on this side. On the other side, uh, they drove out from Terry. Okay, here's the car that has the most of bodies in. And <clears throat> there, this is not water. This is mud and sand right here. But they had to tear the roof apart, open it up like a tin can to get in and start taking bodies out. And that's what's here and over here. And these these bodies were uh, underneath the seats uh, at a terrible time getting these people out. I mean, they had to uh, get the mud and the sand out and they had to uh, take some of the seats out and to get underneath them and this kind of stuff. So it wasn't, it wasn't a real pretty scene. This plane <clears throat> took some aerial photos of the area. It was uh, hired by a, in Miles City by a guy named Harold Krauss, who was living in Miles City, who um, 15 years later moved to Harlow. And uh, he and my father were good friends, and his son was in my high school class. And, and uh, But anyway, he had hired this plane to take, uh, and get up and take some pictures of this accident. This is looking from the accident scene across the Yellowstone River. And on the far side, you can see where the railroad track is, and now the interstate's on the other side of that. Mm -hmm. uh, here's some more pictures of, uh, of the engine. Um, uh, this is the tender. Uh, you can see how violent it was, how tore up this stuff is. Here's some people um, showing up, um, looking at the scene. This is the engine 220. This is after it was rebuilt. Mm -hmm. You can't put that on the track. Mm -hmm. And it ran up in the early 50s. And this was a steam engine. And um, later engines uh, were diesel, but at this time it was steam. And when they took the engineer out, he was still sitting in his seat, but he was scalded to death. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened in these engines that had an accident. Uh, some of happened in the boiler, and a lot of times people inside were killed. Yes, that a 480? Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a railroad buff in that sense. 484. 484? It's 484. It's 484. Okay. Okay. Can't see the tag. Um, here's another picture of that <coughs> rail sticking out. Okay, this is, the, this is the car sitting down below, and this is one of the girders um, that uh, the track ran on. And there's a caterpillar sitting on a pile of ties, 
<clears throat> you can see all this gravel that was deposited here. And uh, you see how the water came underneath and eroded under here. Uh, and you saw a picture where the water was up about here. <clears throat> well, at one point it was above the windows. So you came across here and you can see how much water was going underneath that, that area. And this is as we're starting to move uh, cars out of the way and they're, they're building this track. This picture is taken June 26th, a week later, and they were almost ready to start running cars, the, the train back on this track. Wow. But in a week's time, they had put this thing back together. Did they, they reconstruct the piers? Pardon? Did they reconstruct the piers? Reconstruct the piers. Um, and then once they got it reopened, they got everything out of the way, then they built a uh, bridge around it and took this out and rebuilt the one they did in 1942. You can see one of the, that's the tender over here, I think. This just shows how some of the cars were uh, on the west side here and across here. Here's one of the piers. Here's a pier here that was turned with this car was against it. That's the one that floated down most of the two uh, trusses uh, to the bridge that uh, the car was sitting on. And this shows uh, just some of the wooden piers they used to get the bridge open as quick as they could. So what stopped the cars that didn't go off? Uh, the brakes. So the, the bra brakes set up. The engineer was able to throw the brakes. Well, no, I, I don't think he was able to set the brakes, but one, once they started on a couple up, up ahead, uh, everything sets up. Uh, just like a truck. If the air holds brakes or something, the brakes, the air is used to keep the brakes open. Right. If anything happens to that, everything shuts. But, but, Dad said, that's not woke him up. Uh, the train stopped him. What woke him up was just the silence. <laughs> that's my father. He died two, two years after this picture was taken. That is a county road now? It's a county road now, yeah. One lane traffic? Yeah, one lane. That's great, it was just 1942. Yeah, yeah. This just shows some of that uh, rough country to the north. I mean, there's 220 square miles of that kind of stuff. There's someone here that uh, had a place up in there as dad did. And uh, <coughs> this picture is looking east. And down there, about four or five hundred yards, there's a bend. And the train turns. And uh, so they were coming around that corner at 51 miles an hour when they, when they hit this bridge. And uh, so and headlights on engines are really good headlights, so they can see a long way. And, uh, and they have recorders on the, on the engines, and they knew that they never set the brakes. Uh, so the engineer had no idea what was happening. And I've got some uh, testimony here about, uh, about uh, how they could tell there was something wrong with the bridge by running the speeder over to a gas car, which they call like the pickups you drive up down the tracks with. They'll, they'll have a section they're concerned about. They'll go backwards and forwards. Uh, they'll ride a fast train. They'll ride a slow train. Uh, they get out and spec, and they say if there's a half inch difference in the track in a certain area, they can tell them. And so the sky and the speeder and the car and the train that went through there before this an hour and a half um, said there's nothing wrong. I just from downstream looking back up. Did you say? Did you say the train was behind schedule? Uh, just ten minutes. Uh, so left he, his name. he was going a little bit faster. Well, no, that was uh, 51 mile an hour, probably about the normal speed. <laughs> would go. And. Uh, uh, so that wasn't, the speed wasn't on the lines. And he'd slow down to the, um, uh, where the water was on the track at Calypso. So it wasn't, 
you know, later in life, when the Milwaukee Road was getting ready to shut down, uh, they were speed limits at five miles an hour on some of that track. We got even a freight train. Uh, they just couldn't go fast at all because it wasn't very good shape. I'm going to interrupt for just a minute, Bill. Um, if you do have a question, if you could wait till I could come around with the microphone. That way, we're, we're taping this. That way, the folks at home when it's taped can hear the question. Okay. Are you ready for questions, yeah, Bill? Uh, yeah, I just, there was something here I wanted to mention. But I can find it. Um, Well, I don't think I'll worry about it, but I do want to. Uh, so they had two inquests. One was uh, on Monday, and then they had another one a week later. And they pretty much interviewed railroad employees that came to the accident site, uh, interviewed the undertaker, and people like that. Uh, In-depth questions. They did a good job questioning. But both of those inquests, the jury came up with a not guilty, it wasn't the railroad's fault. That fall, things started to change. And uh, some questions arose about the condition of the piers, especially under the metal part of the bridge. There was two sections of, um, excuse me, two sections of metal. And then the next two sections were uh, concrete. Uh, trusses underneath, underneath the track. And there was what they called a, I think, a bent uh, built underneath one of them with wood to help support it. So there's some questions being asked. And I've got a whole sheaf of papers, uh, the adjusters uh, back and forth between these adjusters, the chief adjuster, assistant adjusters. And they began to realize they had a problem. There were several lawsuits were filed. People were wanting five, six thousand dollars. And the railroad said, no, 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 you were thirty-five hundred dollars is the max. Well anyway, there was a letter. Um, these are October 10th, 1938. These are by about the Lawless death claim, L-A-L-L-A-S. I think there was two of them killed in maybe a husband and wife. This morning I received your letter of the seventh. Uh, in the above claim, and this is from the general adjuster uh, to the assistant general adjuster. The further we get into our investigation of bridge number 438, which collapsed in Saugus, the worse it looks for the railroad company. In the event that we have to go to trial in any of our cases, for this reason, we are very anxious to close as many cases as possible before a suit is instituted. I went over this matter again this morning with Mr. Jefferson, and we both feel that settlement should be made in the lawless claims if you have to pay as high as $15,000. So they were trying to settle these things in a hurry before anything else can happen. And another letter, at this meeting, the facts concerning Bridge AA 438, which our investigation has so far disclosed or discussed, not only the, f the facts concerning Bridge AA 438, but the condition of other bridges on the TM, I don't know what the TM stood for, were discussed. In view of the facts disclosed, it was the opinion of Mr. Scandret and all others at the meeting that if these cases now in suit in Minnesota should go to trial, the railroad would get a lot of very unfavorable advertising and criticism to say nothing of a larger judgment. So, there were some things starting to show up that showed there was some culpability by the railroad. So here's another claim. I'm returning here with your file S3, claim of the Custer County Creamery in the amount of $16.90 and your file L52 Armory Creamery in the amount of $71.48. These claims rose out of the loss of cream being shipped on number 15, involved in the wreck at Custer Creek. Well, this guy says, I don't have the authority to approve this, so I'm sending it to you. You can approve it. So here they are. $100 worth of cream claim. And they're <laughs> passing the buck. And on the other hand, they're trying to rush these uh, payments to these families up to $15,000. And uh, so anyway, are there any questions or comments? 
Yes. You said there were people on the train that were under contract. What does that mean? Um, I'm not exactly sure, but I would, I would think that, that maybe just employees. Okay, and, and there was different classes of passengers. There was ones that uh, had passes, so they or their spouse worked for the railroad. And uh, there's those that had annual passes, and uh, that had something to do with employees. And then there was revenue passengers, and those were the ones that were paying full fare. And uh, um, yeah, and then the 14 month old baby, they never did find, by the way. Yes. Yes. Uh, I was wondering what kind of a camera your dad had. Those are really good pictures. Oh uh, yeah, and I, and I can't tell you what it was. Uh, uh, it, it was a good camera. Yes, and did it for war too. And, and uh, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? There we go. Did the rescue train come on the um, MP track? No, the rescue train came on the Milwaukee track and from Miles City to the accident scene and in the back and uh, in the Miles City. So how did they get the injured across the creek? Well, the injured were on that side of the creek. They the were injured already, were on the west side. Okay, yeah, they, they were, were on the west, on the west side. side. And so, and then another train left Miles City and went on the Northern Pacific track to Terry and then came up the track uh, to the accident scene, hooked on to the observation car, the two sleepers, and the uh, dining car, and okay. pulled it in the Terry and then the Mall City. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. I'd also just like to recommend that everybody who's interested watch the movie Danger in Lights, which was filmed in Mile City and uh, the Longworks. Mm -hmm. well, well, out of cost, the little long bar and bottom uh, bar. But you know, you can see the Milwaukee, the Milwaukee engines from 1930, about that same size, yeah. and what they look like. Well, it's on you know, film uh, for you, 60 mile cruise. 60 mile cruise. Yeah. Yeah. Danger lights. Yes, danger lights. Mm -hmm. I understand that there were about uh, uh, an overload at the Miles City Hospital, Holy Rotary, and uh, the few passengers that were able to be taken to Terry uh, overloaded that hospital immediately. And so then, of course, Miles City was only about 35 miles, but then they had to go to Glendive uh, for people to, uh, that were injured as well. And of course, that was a farther trip form, but anyway, those hospitals uh, helped out the best they could, but they were over, uh, really overwhelmed with the number of people yeah. who were injured. The, the Miles City Hospital especially, uh, because there was no injured on the east side, on the Terry side. So originally there was nobody taken to Terry, uh, and there could have been some later taken from Miles City to Terry to, for help. They had about 15, Patients, roughly, they were still in the hospital uh, a week and a half after the accident. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this this has nothing to do. Uh, me, this has nothing to do with this train wreck. But Saturday uh, morning at ten o'clock until three minutes and we have uh, well I guess it's a giant uh, HOG model railroad mail downtown. Uh, we uh, encourage people to come down for some charge. We, well, you know, you can buy it, don't you? If you're conscious it doesn't bother you buy it. Up and over to the box. But anyway, uh, it's uh, uh, Northwest on the Railroad Historical Association. Okay, awesome. Uh, and we, no, I 
it's a uh, it's a six nineteen uh, North uh, Last Chance Boat. Now, if, uh, if we have old timers, uh, that's in the basement. Well, the kind of sub basement of the uh, old Palmer Thompson building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have you ever seen any pictures of the speed recorders? You know, how they got that speed right down to the 51 miles an hour? How, uh, how did they, that, they, were, they, were they on a drum? They had a drum. They had a tape oh, yeah. system, yeah. So they knew what the speed was, yeah. And a lot of times, uh, I know another trade has been on, they've been in the last car is where those were at. Oh. Uh, because those in the front, uh, if they had an accident, usually were destroyed. So the ones so I've seen in the van, the last car. Oh. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah. Did we have a question over here? This will be our last question. Did you say there's going to be a book written soon? Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, or somebody can address that. Uh, I, Diane, <coughs> right. sure. Um, I'll take one minute in the spotlight. Hi, everyone. I'm Diana DiStefano. I'm the um, publications manager at the Historical Society, and I want to congratulate Bill on his talk. Those photos are amazing. Thank you so much for sharing those. Um, we are also, um, the Historical Society is working with author Ian Wilson on a book, Catastrophe at Custer Creek, that is an in-depth look at this. Um, and the author has um, tracked down many of the families and um, found their stories. And, and it's a really incredible book. It'll be coming out hopefully um, by the summer this year. So. Anyway, I just, I, what a great collaboration to have this talk and, sorry, the opportunity to, to, to pre-sale our wonderful book coming out. Thank you. All right, well, everybody, thanks for coming. Um, there is a sign-up sheet on the table here as you leave if you'd like to be on our email list for all of our programs as they come up. Um, if you'd like to join us on January 23rd, we will be celebrating the Chinese New Year. Um, did I say January? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mark Johnson will be here talking about his book, Keeping Chinese Culture Alive on the Montana Frontier. And it's, a, it's an amazing book and he's an amazing speaker. So I hope you join us at that time. But if you want to know more about what we're doing, sign up, of course. And of course, we do need your email. Thank you all for joining us.